welding up a square frame from start to finish. If you picked up a brand new welder, the first thing you're going to want to do is check the settings. Grab some plate, mine's eighth inch, it doesn't matter what it is because you're going to be using the machine suggested settings to start off with. By doing a little test like this, you're testing out the machine to see if the settings are hot, cold, or just right. The first beat is just to give you a feel for the machine and to make sure that it actually works. Would have continued on with those same settings, but I did want to turn it down just to show you what a cold weld would look like. It's small, heaped up, and you can see that it's not tied into that base material. And then I turned it up a little bit, uh, still a little cold right here, got a little warmer towards the end. And lastly, on the opposite end, if you got a weld that is just big, uh, inconsistent, and burning through, your settings are way too high. On the flip side, I went back to those suggested settings and uh, just threw down a couple more welds as practice, and they turned out pretty good. This is 8th inch plate, and since I have 8th inch wall thickness for my square tubing, I'm going to keep the settings exactly the same. A square frame out of square tubing is perfect for your first welding project. I use square tubing because, first of all, it's pretty readily available, cheap, and the applications are endless. I've done full go-kart frames, railings, uh, light fixtures, coffee tables, you name it. I love it, and I always have it on hand in my garage. Second reason for this is it actually incorporates different types of welds for you to be able to practice on. For example, you've got a corner weld, a butt weld, and a fillet weld on the inside. Now, if you were to just cut your steel pieces at 90 degrees like this and butt them up together, you would actually get a groove weld, and that's because square tubing actually has a radius on the corners. It's not a sharp corner. So when you butt that up, it actually creates a groove. Thus, you get a groove weld with it as well. Now the one drawback to making the nice easy 90 degree cuts is when you put them together you have an open end. So usually for frames if it's going to be something I'm showing off or on display then I like to miter my cuts. It does take a little longer but you miter the cuts and then you can butt them up together and it makes a nice seamless weld. No open ends. Just makes for a nicer finished product. All the tools I'll be using I talked about in my last video, so you can watch that and I'll also put a link to all of those in the description. The angle grinder will be your best friend. If you have a lot of cuts then it might be worth getting a chop saw or a band saw. Once cut, clean up those rough edges or any flashing left over and that can easily be done with a quick pass of either the grinder wheel or flapper disc goes without saying but you do get a better weld if you're not going trying to go through a bunch of rust. Setting up the pieces so it doesn't distort on you. Since you are melting and cooling the metal, physics can do wonders on your piece. As the weld is cooling it will want to pull the piece together. If you do this fillet weld right in the beginning, what once was a nice 90 degree will turn into a cute angle. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Stupid geometry jokes. To get the least amount of distortion, try to fix every piece in place, then tack it. A tack weld is a small weld that holds the piece in place until you can do the full weld. Now since it's just a small tack, there is not that much heat going into the piece, thus very little distortion. For a smoother, consistent bead for your final weld, grind down your tacks. Even though the piece is all tacked up, you still want to weld the joints that distort the least first. And that would be a corner weld. A fill weld pulls the most, so we'll leave that for last. I'm starting on the corner joint, and look at the end. It comes to a point, so in other words, there's not that much material there that you're going to be welding. So whatever your settings are for the thickness you're doing, turn it down one thickness. I want to weld that entire length without running down into the plate. So I've propped it up and that also gives me a little more room to make that full weld. If you want that spatter to just brush away, use some anti-spatter spray. All you got to do is do a quick spray on your piece prior to welding and then dip your tip in the nozzle gel to extend the life of that contact tip.
Now moving on to the butt welds. As mentioned before, if the corners weren't mitered, then we would have a nice pocket to fill it and that would be a groove weld. Don't forget to turn the settings back up. Take note of your stick out. That would be the amount of wire that is sticking out from your contact tip. You'll want around a half of an inch. The angle. Go straight down into the weld, making it 90 degrees, then clock it back 10 to 15 and pull. If there's slag, then drag. Lastly, watch your speed. Obviously, if you're moving too fast, you're not going to give it enough time for a puddle to form. The last weld is the inside corner, and that would be a fillet weld. I'm propping it up again, and that's because, if at all possible, place your pieces so that you can do a flat horizontal weld. It's much easier than a vertical and overhead. Once you turn the corner, hold it there for a second to tie into that existing side. You can clean up with either a wire brush or wire wheel, and if the welds are good, then you're done. But since it's the first one, let's say some of them didn't turn out that great. Well, a grinder and paint make the welder you ain't. Take out your grinder and have at it. With the weld ground down, you can simply finish the project, but I'd say take this opportunity to, to weld over it again for more practice. And personally, I like the good looking weld shown anyway. If you do want the welds ground down, start with the grinder wheel and finish with the flapper disc. Since the flapper disc is sandpaper, think of it like finishing a wood project. The higher grit you go, the smoother or shinier your finish you're gonna get. If you do want it painted, no need to go higher than 80. The final step prior to paint is to do a quick wipe down with either acetone or a cleaner. This will get off any residual oils and dust from the welding and it will prep it for paint. Overall, this is actually the same size frame that I used for my pendant lights that turned out, I think, pretty good. If you've got the material and want to bump up the size, this actually is a perfect start to a go-kart frame. That's all I got for this one. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.